Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome those of you that are here in person, and welcome to our online audience as well. It's a pleasure to have you all here for the uh, rollout of a, of a new report that we've completed that relates to a very popular and controversial topic these days, which is export controls and export control, in this case, export control enforcement. Uh, those of you that, that know me know that I used to have the, the job of our guest today, Under Secretary Estevez, and I, one of the things I learned when I had the job was that for those of you Washington policy wonks, you know about this. There's something called the Plum Book, which has all the cool jobs listed um, that are political appointments. And if you're looking for one, you go get the Plum Book every time an administration changes. What most people don't know is that there's also something called the Prune Book. Uh, and the Prune Book is all the federal jobs that are really hard and nobody wants. Um, and Alan's job is in the Prune Book. Um, and it's in the prune book because it's a difficult, challenging job. The people who do export controls have to walk the inevitably very fine line between under controlling, in which case the adversaries get things you don't want to not want them to have, and over controlling, in which case you end up depriving your own high tech companies of the revenue they need to grow and prosper and develop next generation technologies. Uh, so it's controversial, it's difficult, it's become more controversial and more difficult uh, as our relationship with China has deteriorated and has, as their technological accomplishments have, have uh, grown significantly. So I don't envy uh, the job that he has. Here at CSIS, we spent a lot of time looking at this problem from different perspectives. Uh, in particular, we've spent some time focusing on, on enforcement because it's not only a question of, of sort of regulatory policy, deciding what should go and what should not go, which occupies most of the oxygen in the, in, the, in the debate. It's also a question of whether you can effectively enforce the decisions you make uh, and ensure that the stuff you don't want to go, in fact, does not go. Uh, and that is a whole layer of difficulty. When I was doing this, it was a little easier because most of the stuff that was going or not going was physical. Uh, it could be stopped at the, do at the dock on the border and inspected and checked. In a digital world, that's very different. Uh, and the job of enforcement has become much more complicated when you can export things, particularly technology, with several, uh, several clicks and you know, one of these tablets. So the job is um, more complicated and more challenging. And we spent a lot of time here at CSIS looking at it. Uh, the Shoal Chair did a report last year on a new <clears throat> hardware and software tool that companies could embed into their products that would provide a greater degree of certainty that the tool, whatever it was, was being used only by those authorized to use it and only in a way that was authorized uh, by BIS, a tool that we thought would, would enhance enforcement capabilities and enhance the licensing decision-making process. This year, we focused on something different, which is what we're going to turn to now, and that is the question of whether we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to enhance the enforcement capabilities uh, of BIS. And that necessitated a look at the technology, but also a look at, at BIS's resources and the challenges they make. So what we're going to do today is the principal author of that paper is Greg Allen of the Technology and Security uh, Program. He's going to present the paper and tell you what our findings were. And then he and uh, Under Secretary Estevez and I are going to take the podium. We're, uh, we're going to, Alan's going to make some comments about the paper, and then we're going to have a conversation. And then we will close with uh, audience Q&A. For those of you that are here in person in the audience, there's a stand-up mic right over there. And when we get to that point, I'll just invite you to go over and, and line up. For those of you that are online, uh, there's a thing on the screen that you know what to do that will tell you what to do if you want to submit a question. And in theory, I have a tablet here that will send me all your questions and I will be able to ask them. So with that, let me turn it over to Greg to tell you what our conclusions were and what we did. Thanks, Bill. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'd like to start with a quote from National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who in September 2023, after the uh, export controls against Russia in response for its invasion of Ukraine, said that the export controls, quote, 
demonstrated that technology export controls can be more than just a preventative tool. If implemented in a way that is robust, durable, and comprehensive, they can be a new strategic asset in the U.S. and allied toolkit to impose costs on adversaries and even over time degrade their battlefield capabilities. And that quote coming from a national security advisor is a remarkable statement that I think reflects a new reality that export controls are at the heart of U.S. technology and national security policy. They are relevant and critical in a way that they have not been in decades. Um, however, when we were thinking about this paper and what we wanted to say about export controls, we recognized that the conversation that Washington, D.C. in particular was having about export controls was incomplete. There was a great deal of conversation on should we export control this technology, should we export control that technology, should we export control it to this country or to that country. But what was missing from the conversation was a discussion about export control's capacity. Because with the response that we have put upon Russia in response to its invasion of Ukraine, one of the most dramatic expansions in the number of export controlled items, that is a direct challenge to Russia. Literally, the survivability and health of their economy, the viability of their war machine, depends upon circumventing these export controls. And so while they do not publish the budget of how much they are spending on evading export controls, it is obvious that the amount that Russia is spending to evade export controls has increased massively. They are doing everything that they can to get around these export controls because these export controls are so threatening to their economy. And so I want to read a second quote. This comes from the president of Kalashnikov, one of the major Russian weapons manufacturers. And here's what he said about the situation facing his, uh, his company vis-a-vis -vis export controls. Quote, there are no problems getting microchips because the component base cannot be 100% closed off to Russia. It is impossible to isolate Russia from the entire global electronic component base. It is a fantasy to think otherwise. Now, understandably, there is some bluster in that quote and some need to so show confidence in what is obviously a difficult time uh, for Russia and its weapons manufacturing quote. But I think we should also view that quote as the gauntlet being thrown down that Russia is going to try and do whatever it takes to get around these export controls, because for them, the stakes are incredibly, incredibly high. And there is some evidence that these export controls are being evaded, although we don't really have great a sense of to what extent. But weapons recovered from battlefields in Ukraine include microelectronics manufactured by U.S. companies, including microelectronics manufactured years after export controls were expanded in 2000, uh, 2014. And so all of that evidence, I think, led us to want to ask the question, in the face of massively increased challenges to export control enforcement, what could we do to boost the Department of Commerce and the Bureau of Industry and Security's capacity to enforce these export controls? The conversation is too often, as we said before, about what are we export controlling and too incomplete in terms of how can we increase our capacity and our efficacy for controlling those export controls. So for this project, we interviewed more than 50 people, including uh, current and former BIS officials, uh, Bureau of Industry and Security at the Department of Commerce, uh, other individuals from around the U.S. intelligence community, from other agencies in the U.S. government that have mission sets that are comparable to this mission set, and from companies that are regulated by BIS, and from companies that provide technologies relevant to BIS's problem set in both the private sector and the public sector. Nearly every single person that we spoke to came away with a unified conclusion that BIS is in urgent need of a technology upgrade. That essentially there are relevant capabilities that are currently being used in the intelligence community, that are being used in the Department of Treasury, that are being used in the Department of Defense, and these are capabilities that are not always tackling the same problem. They're th things like supply chain security monitoring. But they have capabilities such as tracking vessel shipments that are very relevant to the same problem set that BIS has to deal with when it's trying to monitor exports and ensure that they are uh, abiding by the licensing process. So this technology is out there, and it really would make a big difference in BIS's ability to do so. 
I want to just list a few of the capabilities that we think would make a real difference uh, in BIS's ability to do its job. Automatic alerting of changes that would affect the validity of a previously approved export license. For example, a company that was not Russian and was therefore approved for an export license suddenly is acquired by a Russian ownership entity. Well, that changes the validity of a previously owned license, and you would want that to be made immediately available to BIS analysts or a system that can provide entity resolution capabilities to establish that different entities are likely related. For example, automatically detecting that a purported Eastern European tractor manufacturer has the same phone number as a supplier of engines to the Russian military. This is the type of stuff that you do not want people, uh, individuals, combing through tens of billions of records. This demands automation because ultimately the export controls enforcement of the United States comes down to a few hundred men and women in the Bureau of Industry and Security overseeing hundreds of billions of dollars in trade transactions. And for them to operate at the necessary speed and scale for U.S. national security, they need technology that gives them the productivity and power that will allow them to do their jobs effectively. And I want to be clear about the conclusions that we reach in this paper. BIS is better at its job than any comparable agency anywhere in the world. The problem here is not that BIS is bad. The problem here is that BIS's job has gotten far, far, far harder in just the past 12 months. And in the U.S. national security, we are constantly looking for where the threats are and where the opportunities are. And we ultimately conclude that the costs of these technological investments are incredibly modest. We found that for around $45 million a year in BIS annual budgeting, they could procure not only the entire technology suites they need, but also the staff increases that they need to effectively adopt these technologies. That's a pretty small number by U.S. national security standards. That's a helicopter or two in terms of budget for what we're talking about here. But we conclude that it is quite possibly one of the highest return on investment opportunities available anywhere in U.S. national security. When we finished writing this paper, the frustration that I had was asking myself, why didn't we make this investment the day after Russia invaded Ukraine, knowing that this challenge was absolutely coming down the pike? Um, and every time I see any Russian weapon system recovered on the battlefield in Ukraine, I hope that it doesn't have Western components in it. And I ask myself, if we were to make this investment, how many new Russian weapons would never reach the battlefield in the future? And I think this is an investment that Congress, I hope, uh, will find worthy of making as it debates the Ukraine wartime supplemental appropriation uh, right now. Uh, and I'll stop there and invite Bill to move us. Well, thank you for that. Um, why don't we begin simply by asking Alan to, to comment. Uh, what do you think? So, first of all, thank you to Bill, Greg, CSIS for allowing me to come up here and talk about what we're doing at BIS, to comment on your paper, to make my own pitch for resources while I'm sitting here, which I would be remiss if I did not do. Uh, but I do have a couple of thoughts. Uh, and I need to say it's not much harder in the last 12 months because I became the <laughs> <laughs> undersecretary. Yep. It's harder because the threat level has increased and what we are doing with export controls is in some regards unprecedented. In fact, let me quote someone who says that. We have to be faster in deciding questions connected to supplying the special military operation and countering restrictions on the economy, which without any exaggeration are truly unprecedented, Vladimir Putin. So we are making an impact, and I'll go further than that. Uh, Avril Haines at the Reagan National Defense Forum, where I was over the weekend, so many of, uh, some of you may have been out there, uh, uh, so many national security professionals said that Russia cannot replace, this is an open source, so she was obviously using open source material to make her comment, can't replace on their own what they are expending when it comes to a variety of munitions. So 
yes, you're going to find Western technology in that. The question is, when did that Western technology arrive? And, uh, you know, even there's a, paper, a story in the Times today, in the New York Times today, talking about that. Um, new munitions off the assembly line that were expended with Western technology in them. And I would say, does anyone here, and I'll ask the press, my press colleagues, who knows what the stockpile was in Russian factories and you know, wherever they're getting chips from when they started this? Because having run supply chains for the Department of Defense, we don't live on what well, just in time. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there, is a, there is a stockpile that you grow on. And again, I can, for those of you who don't understand the supply chain, the way it works, think back to COVID when you were all wondering whether you had toilet paper uh, and when you were going to run out and when the store might have it again. So same thing applies to production. Now, with that said, I wholeheartedly concur with your bottom line conclusion that an expenditure in BIS for one, probably one helicopter, otherwise it'd be an incredibly cheap helicopter for a <laughs> DOD, certainly not fully outfitted. Uh, you know, the, the, an investment in DIS, uh, BIS is an incredible investment with a good return on investment in national security. So we can certainly use more people, more tools. And I, when I got there, one of the first things I said is, whoa, we need some automated tools and type of things that you were talking about to help us do our job. I also need to point out, though, that BIS and my about 200 agents are not alone in their mission, right? We work very closely with the IC uh, in, our, in that mission. I work with HSI, CBP, FBI, and importantly, our allied uh, friends, who are some of whom do not have near the robust capability that I have uh, to do their job. So it's not a one for one. It's a one for many that we leverage in order to do our job. Uh, and to your earlier comment, I think we're pretty good at it. So I'd be thrilled, though, to get some more capability in there in both manpower and automated capability, because I think that would really help us do it even better than we're doing it today. So let me stop there, and let's dive into a discussion. Well, I think. Uh, in general, I, as a former bureaucrat, you know, more is always better than less, and uh, the answer is often, sure, that's good, but more would be better. Uh, but make a comment on the amount. Have, have, have we got it right? Is, uh, is one helicopter enough, if, <laughs> as it were, or uh, do you need more? Um, if I put that over the five-year period that you asked for, that's probably pretty good. I probably need more up front. I mean, I'm asking for more up front, to tell you the truth. Yeah, because because right, I have not had a chance to affect the budget yet, uh, and you know we're working <laughs> through that process for the 24. Because the FY23 24. request predates your Predate, yeah. predates me. Uh, and again, you know, we there are some of those tools that are actually readily available and not all that expensive. Uh, getting some analysts to work on those tools, and frankly, it's not just the enforcement side where I need manpower. You know, the licensing regimes that we're putting on for Russia and China are pretty incredible. I need, like, analysts, China sell analysts, Russia sell analysts, uh, people who understand distribution networks, uh, because it's gotten way more complicated to help us work through that. And, and we're, in the paper, we're primarily highlighting the enforcement side of the equation, but from a technological infrastructure perspective, a lot of the tools that you would build would be doubly useful for the licensing community and for the enforcement community. And frankly, some of them for my industrial-based assessment mm. requirement. Yeah. Right, so I'd get value out of one tool across the breadth of uh, BIS, including my ICTS mission for that. Yeah. Although the ICTS mission, I just want to, uh, to harp on this for uh, one second, because if you look at the FY23 budget request, you know, there is a significant increase for BIS, uh, but it's just important for folks to understand that that is for this, a lot of that, not all of that, is for this new mission, ICTS, which is primarily around import policing. So uh, BIS, you know, got a new mission. Uh, this new mission is called ICTS. Uh, the Biden administration requested additional funds to execute this new mission, but it is sort of separate from the, the traditional core mission of export controls enforcement. And uh, I'll make the same comment I made at the Reagan Forum with regard to that. 
while we were sitting in a CR, here we are in December, three months into the new fiscal year, or two and a half months into the new fiscal year, that mission remains unfunded yeah. because it is a new start and it is not funded in 22. So I am doing that mission, which is, I'd go further than an import control mission, it's actually a protection of critical infrastructure mission, uh, remains at risk and unfunded because the way I do that mission is I trap lawyers, drag them into the Commerce Building and say, hey, you've used a cell phone, you know something about this, <laughs> just help me out. A lot, of the, um, a lot of the discussion in the paper and a lot of Greg's presentation focused for obvious reasons on Russia because it's the more immediate problem. Um, and there's been you know, a lot of looking at you know, Russian uh, missile parts or weapons parts to looking for Western technology. Um, talk a little bit about China for us because you've just issued a new rule in October that applies primarily to China, exclusively to China, really. How has that changed your enforcement burden, and how has it made it more complicated? Uh, obviously, that's a very, very complex rule uh, with lots of moving pieces. Now, the reality is, you know, it's easier to smuggle and to hide distribution of through, you know, uh, process it through front companies and the like uh, for microelectronics, let's say, than for EUV and uh, you know, or LAM, KLA applied chip making machines. They're much bigger, they have uh, track record, and you need someone to set them up. But, you know, look, Iran does the same thing trying to you know, help its nuclear mission, so does North Korea. Uh, so over time, these people are going to work networks, and they're complex networks, and we need to work it. The chip side of what we just did, you know, the highest end chips, obviously, China's going to try to work around that. And the same thing is. And it's not just U.S. sourced, right? Because a lot of that is fabbed overseas, managed overseas. So it's a complex mission. And again, why I have to use not just uh, BIS uh, personnel who understand the rule and the rule set, but we need to draw on the IC and we need to draw on our allies as we do those things. I'll just add to that, right? We were emphasizing how the export controls in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine are sort of this critical threat to their economy and to the viability of their war machine. And so, of course, they are throwing the kitchen sink at evading these export controls. Well, in the case of China, you know, leadership in AI, AI modernization, is the number one technology priority listed in the five-year economic plan. And these export controls are a direct challenge to that top priority goal. And so I think it's a pretty safe bet that they are also going to throw the kitchen sink. Now, you know, I don't want to get into a, because we've already had the discussion with many people in this room about what the China rule says. But, you know, we didn't completely shut China sure, down from right. doing it's a, AI, a top, yeah. AI uh, research. But, you know, if you're a researcher and you're at the top level, you want to research with the top level tools. Right. And they won't have that anymore. Right. So some of those people will go elsewhere. Uh, but, you know, to the bottom line point, yes, I could always, you know, new tools, new capabilities would be very helpful to me in doing that mission. In fact, you know, I was just out in Silicon Valley. And I was talking to some companies out there, not companies that I'm controlling, companies that, hey, you have a real cool tool that I might be able to use for this mission. And, and trying to figure out how to pay for it is you know, going to be another problem which is where you're coming in to help me, Greg. <laughs> Do you think your staff has the training necessary to operate the technology that we're talking about? Most of, you know, some of this stuff I've sold as a consultant, right? supply chain illumination tools, for example. Uh, it's not exactly plug and play, but uh, you know, there's, it's, not, it's not PhD learning curve stuff either. Right? And some of it is you buy it as a service. Right, so it's, I don't need the tool itself. I need, here's what I want you to run. You know, here's the report I need you to run. You know, alerts and things like that. You set up and it just comes to you. What's your, uh, let me go back to Russia for a minute because we've been talking about the um, efforts to circumvent, which are inevitable. Uh, and there's always going to be leakage uh, because there's criminals out there that 
uh, make that to make a, a living doing that. What's your current assessment of how successful you're being with respect to Russia? The, the secretary in the past has had, and you, I think, has had some data on the extent to which you, you think you've uh, successfully implemented the controls. What's your current assessment of that? Uh, I mean, I still think that we're doing pretty well. Again, I'll you know, my quote from Avril, uh, from uh, ODI Director Haynes, uh, from over the weekend, shows that the IC has an assessment to some degree that we're being successful in squeezing Russia's military reconstitution capability. Let me be narrow here. Right? It's, when I'm talking about cracking the greater economy of Russia, which I also think we're impacting, but their ability to reconstitute what they're expending on the battlefield in Ukraine, uh, they're in a world of hurt. When you have to go to North Korea to buy shells that you sold them, 15, 20 years ago, so that you can expend back. Or when you take the nuclear warhead off of cruise missiles so that you can use it as a dumb bomb in Ukraine, shows that they're uh, expending munitions that they can't replace. Some of that's industrial base related. I mean, we have industrial base issues here too. Uh, but a lot of that also has to do with they can't get the capability to rebuild. And so on Russia, are you satisfied with the level of allied cooperation? I'm very satisfied with the level of allied cooperation. What I'd like more cooperation is from fence sitters. And I said, even, even in that regard, many of them are actually not supplying, but you know, they're, they're also not looking and searching. And you know, we need to like, look for those distribution networks and shut them down. And what kind, <clears throat> are you talking to those? Fence sitters, if you will. I don't want to ask you to identify them, but I think we all know. Are you talking to them actively? We're, we have a vibrant international outreach program. And what are they saying back? Uh, you know, some of them like, will say, they'll say what I just said. They're not resupplying, so they're not backfilling Russia. Uh, some of them don't even really have enforcement capability to begin with, to tell you the truth. Uh, and, and they'll, they'll say, you know, they're working as a fence that are wood, both sides. Uh, but, you know, I think if Russia did something uh, egregious, and not that the whole thing isn't egregious, right? Let me be clear, it is. But if they decided to go nuclear or, you know, went, went into the Cambaya space, I think you'd see some of those c countries move off the fence. So what kind of co cooperation are you getting on China? And what are your expectations there? from our allies? Uh, we're having robust, robust dialogue with our allies. Um, and yeah, you've been saying that since October. Have you got any results? <clears throat> Stand by. Um, I think okay. Prime Minister Kishida is paying the United States a visit in January or February time frame, so okay, that'll be interesting. I, I will say that we are working robustly with our allies, and I, as I said at the end of October, I fully full confidence that we're going to reach agreement. So you mentioned, you know, that in your prior uh, Department of Defense role, you know, you had uh, some experience with technologies that are sort of relevant to the conversation that we're having here today. Um, could you talk a little bit about, like, the impact that you saw from uh, yeah. adopting these technologies? Well, actually, it's or, and as your more in my consultant, consulting the, I job, the time when I was out of government. Uh, I, you know, again, there's a variety of different tools that do different things. You know, supply chain illumination tools, you can t identify what's in a bill of materials. That's not necessarily enforcement, but what it shows is what companies are doing business with whom. You know, so for a Russia backfill capability, theoretically, I can do that. Now, most of these were aimed towards U.S. industry, U.S. supply chains, where we can see our dependencies, which is a big problem, too, dependencies on on China uh, in the supply chain, adversarial nations in the supply chain. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are tools out there that I believe could be focused and turned to look at backfill opportunities, uh, other distribution networks. So we know that distributor X has chips. Who are they doing business with? And I think you could turn that and start then getting leads through that uh, assessment. And in, in your remarks, you know, you mentioned how, uh, you know, BIS obviously has, you know, a few hundred people with a critical mission, but they're also aided by the intelligence community, by other agencies and government. 
Um, and I want to ask, uh, have you seen, you know, just in the time that you've been leading BIS, have you seen a change in the intelligence community's posture towards your mission set? Um, I don't know that I've seen it since I've come to BIS, but I know that I have a good uh, relationship and good uh, connectivity to the intelligence community. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, not just through me. Uh, obviously, you know, again, we're working heavily in the interagency on these issues related to Russia and China in particular. Uh, so, you know, our interagency partners, many of whom have more directive control over some of the inter uh, IC assets, mm -hmm. are really interested in these issues too. Yeah. Now, look, the IC wasn't, you know, focused on what, well, some of these economic type of issues in the past. Yeah, so they're developing some of their capabilities around this as well. On, on that, uh, we, have a, we have a question from our online audience, which is uh, relevant to what you just said. So I'm going to interrupt the flow of events and ask a question. This comes from our, our old friend Brian Nielsen, who probably knows the system as well as, as anybody, since he was instrumental in the Obama administration's export control reform uh, uh, program. And he says one critical long-term weakness of the interagency system is lack of systemic intelligence support. This was a priority identified during the export control reform exercise in the first ever national intelligence assessment. Yet export controls are still not a priority in the IC. Generally only operating committee and ASAP cases get a formal intelligence review. Otherwise the review is ad hoc. Is this being addressed? Has it been resolved? I, I have way better intelligence feed than just through the ASAP or, or and looking at it. I mean, I, I personally get all sorts of stuff on different fabs that are starting, what they're doing, how they're doing it, where they're doing it, who they're working with uh, in depth. Uh, and same thing with Russia. And again, part of it, the Russia thing is because there's egregious action going on and it's focused intelligence. China, because the threat level has increased so much, it's just part of the nature of assessing China and assessing what they're doing. And, you know, when I have the National Security Advisor looking at, at export controls as a strategic tool in the toolbox, I'm going to get the data that I need to use that strategic tool. So I'm real comfortable with what we get from the IC. I think there is one caveat that I just want to highlight in, in, in some of the things that we heard, which is the you know, even though the IC has monstrous capability, you know, in what, by what mechanism is it transported to you? Because there's a lot of you know, report writing culture in the intelligence community, and they're better than anybody else in the world in that. But there's also you know, massive databases that need to be queryable on a really, time, you know, uh, really instantaneous basis. And I think one of the, the more minor recommendations here, but I think is one that we take seriously, is the need for increased classified facility space at BIS, just so that you can log into some of these networks and access some of these tools that are, that are available on classified networks. You know, my office in the Pentagon was a skiff. It had windows and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all sorts of stuff. Now, obviously, in these days, you can't use your phone, uh, which was sort of my, my phone and my time in the Pentagon was migrating out the door. Yeah. <laughs> I can still be kept in a, um, a lead box, you know. Uh, yeah, I could use more skiff space, for sure. And, you know, commerce as a whole could use more skiff space, not yeah. just BIS. Yeah, and I think there, there's one element of this, is, which is commerce is not a member of the intelligence community. BIS is not a member of the intelligence community. So you have to sort of thread that relationship in a, in a different uh, way than some uh, other agencies I, I, do. I'm not sure, you know, there's goodness and there's badness. Agreed, that. agreed. So yeah. there's reasons for us not to be yep. in the IC. Uh, I, I won't, I'll stop right there on that. Great. Uh, but that does not impede us from our work together. Yep. Should we uh, start taking questions from the audience? So it, we are, and I've got some more. And if, if folks want to line up at the, the microphone, uh, please, please do. do. Let me uh, give you one from uh, also a friend, Anna Swanson of the New York Times. I'm sure you know Anna. Can you talk about what Chinese cooperation is looking like on the ground for end-use checks right now for companies like YMTC? What role does the Chinese government appear to be playing in that? There was just a story on this, so I imagine you're on top of it. Um, and I'm going to be a little um, less candid than I like to be in answering this. Uh, look, the goal of the UVL to EL rule was to drive better behavior from countries that were not 
allowing end use checks. Uh, and we are seeing better behavior. What I'm not going to talk about, and what I meant when I said I'm going to be less, less uh, forthcoming rather than candid, that's probably the better word, is I'm not going to talk about where we are on any particular company and the results of any particular end use check, because that will go through due process and due order. But I will say that Mofcom has been more uh, forthcoming. In, I think that was a thrust. I think that was a thrust of the question. Has there been a change in attitude on the Chinese we're, side in terms of cooperating with these things? We are seeing a change of attitude. It is not the first time we've seen such a change of attitude. So it depends on how long that sustains, on whether we've accomplished our our goal there. Yeah, I can speak to that from personal experience. <laughs> uh, it kind of goes waxes yeah. and wanes yeah. based in yeah, part right. on the state of the overall relationship. All right, let's go with the first person here. Please identify yourself like I'm identifying the online questions. Uh, th thank you. Dimitri, Sevastopolis Financial Times. Um, I understand that you and Tarun Chabra took a little vacation to the Netherlands recently <laughs> to talk about some of these uh, uh, chip tool making companies and trying to get a trilateral deal. But in the past two weeks, the Dutch foreign trade minister and also the Dutch economy minister have come out with public comments suggesting that they're not as forward-leaning as I hear you saying when you say stand by and a, deer, a deal is near. So can you give us a little bit more sense as to why you're so optimistic? Because when I talk to Japanese and Dutch officials, I don't hear the same optimism. I had a great Thanksgiving, Dimitri. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yeah, I had some Dutch beer while I was uh, having my Thanksgiving dinner. Um, look, I, I, at this point, I'm not going to go into details on our discussions with our allies or even who those allies might be. I'll let you guys conjecture all you want on that. Uh, we are having good discussions. I don't expect any other country to say, hey, we're going to come in and let the United States dictate our policies and our plans. However, and I said this, you know, when we chatted last, uh, these countries, our allies, share our values. They uh, share the same threats that we see. Uh, and we're forthcoming with them on what those threats from our perspective are. They also understand the surveillance state nature of some of the tools that were being used by the Chinese uh, that are made using uh, tooling from our countries. Uh, and so when I had discussions and when I've had discussions across the board on that, uh, the reception has been very, very positive. Uh, so, and again, I'm not the only person having discussions. Okay, just quickly follow up and say, you know, you said at a rival think tank a month or so ago that by American companies or by the U.S. government putting skin in the game, it showed the Europeans and the Asians that you were serious about this. What I hear is that they feel slightly blindsided by what happened in October and that are you still as confident that they are going to see you putting skin in the game and just follow suit? I am. Time frame? process. It's a, pro it's a work in progress. Okay. Um, let me uh, actually have a follow-up to Dimitri's question, which is... And I expected that from you, Dimitri. I would have been, would have been sad if you hadn't asked me that question. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously the, the policy as designed, the October 7th uh, export controls towards China, you know, really designed with U.S. national security interests in mind. Uh, but I understand that they also took allied security and allied economic interests, you know, in mind, and that uh, you know steps were taken to make sure that we did not uh, step on anyone's toes. And so I'm just curious, you know, are there elements of the policy that you would highlight, or changes that are being made to the policy following feedback from allies that you would point to to, to uh, indicate how we are taking other our allies' interests into account? You know, obviously the rule is still out for public comment, right? So we're taking input on, on the rule. Frankly, I do not see any massive changes coming. There are some tweaks that we need to do, you know, just clarification of language, uh, clarification of, you know, how we, how we articulate what a high-end fab is, things like that we're being asked for. Um, and, you know, we'll try to accommodate it as best we can on that. Um, I don't see any uh, big, for, first of all, you know, we don't think we blindsided people. We actually did talk to people in, in advance, uh, including companies. 
Um, I mean, I, I was getting at things like, you know, the, the restriction of sales of not just semiconductor manufacturing equipment, but the components that go into this equipment. You know, some of these restrictions are not just designed to prevent the Chinese from reverse engineering U.S. technology. They're also designed to prevent China from reverse engineering allied technology. Again, it's the, well, the purpose of it is to stop China from being able to build high-end chips. Right. Right, right, for use in their military and surveillance state applications, right? Everything around that, it's an intertwined thing. Right. If they can build their own tools, then I haven't really done anything when I stop them from buying our tools, right? In fact, I put our companies and, in fact, those allied companies at risk. So it's an intertwined capability that is intended to impede China's ability to fab the highest end capabilities. Again, it's small, targeted. Uh, we think we've achieved that. Uh, we think, again, our allies understand why we did that. Uh, and we're still working through what that means for them. Okay, and they are allies, let me be clear. They are allies. They do share our, our values and, and our threats here. And Putin has frankly, the chief marketing officer for all this, if you want. And Xi himself is not that unhelpful either when it comes to this. Let me go back to this, to the uh, online for a minute, then we'll get to uh, our next in-person questioner. This is related, which is why I wanted to go to it. Um, uh, and you answered part of it already, the first part. What can we do to push our partners and allies to take export control enforcement more seriously? But then there's a second related question. Can we share some of these enforcement tools with our partners? I'd certainly be willing to. I mean, I'd, you know, if you look at the TC, TTC dialogue from yesterday, sharing of information is certainly one of the topics that was under the export, uh, export control area of that, because we believe it's important to do that. That's how we can work this together. Share our data, and frankly, if, why wouldn't I want to share the capability from which I derive my data, if it's an open source capability? Uh, okay. Next in line over here. Uh, Paula Stern, uh, the Stern Group. Uh, following on the questions about uh, input uh, from the Dutch, um, we have heard. Uh, published uh, that the notion that the United States' export controls um, are uh, targeting a time frame uh, that the Chinese development, it, it, that we have accelerated, if you will, our efforts to slow down the Chinese's goal of um, in the most advanced uh, chip production. Um, but there's doubts that have been expressed by the CEO of the, uh, and other experts um, saying that we've got it wrong, um, that maybe we will slow them down, but um, the time frame uh, for parity, if you will, uh, between our capabilities, our Western capabilities, and the Chinese's uh, goals for their capabilities is much shorter. Um, I'm wondering um, if you can comment on that and whether that suggests we're going to have some follow-on uh, restrictions uh, in, in that arena. In Couple other of words, things. the success factor. Sure, sure. sure. I also want to point out that the CEO of ASML also said that controls will have little impact on him because the highest tool, the highest fabs will move out of China if they need to go elsewhere, which frankly is not a bad thing. Um, and of course, you know, our, our controls on the highest end chips use foreign direct product rule. So it would be hard for any place outside of China to sell back to China without a violation of the foreign direct product rule. Um, as far as our What's the success rate? Of course, you know, the success rate since October 7th, uh, you know, you tell me. Uh, but over time, 
I think we're going to be somewhat successful for a period of time. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, the Chinese are going to get innovative. They're going to do what you just asked me about, Greg. They're going to figure out how to build indigenous. It's very hard. And so they'll be impeded in doing that uh, for some period of time. That is insufficient to protect our national security, right? So what we talk about in commerce, and if you listen to uh, the Secretary Raimondo's China speech last week, if you get a transcript of that, uh, she didn't exactly use these words, but we talk about offense and defense. I'm on the defense side, uh, but there needs to be an offense side. Chips Act in the chip space is one of the tools for the offense side. So we need to invest in innovation in the United States. Uh, my defense colleagues, who I was just sitting with out at Reagan, uh, had this discussion as well. You need, they need to invest in developing the next generation capability for, for defense needs. Just from an economic standpoint, our nation needs to start thinking about what the, the best levels and how we're going to generate the best capability from an economic standpoint. And companies, that's what capitalism is so good at doing, is driving that. So we will impede the Chinese for a number of years. If we play offense properly, that gap will get bigger because we're innovating at the same time we're impeding them to get to, to uh, Sullivan's degrade capability. If I could follow on to that from the offense, and I completely agree with you on, on that, um, how will we handle uh, those uh, either from Taiwan or from China who have been working in China um, who wish to come and do their research and uh, work in the United States. Uh, that talent pool, um, how, what is our policy with, on the offense side? Uh, you're stretching my BIS limits on that to answer that question. Uh, obviously, it is a very complicated question, especially with researchers from China, uh, from other nations, you know, different issues related to, to that. Uh, but all research is not done in the United States that is good research. So let me go there. Uh, so certainly we need to have an innovative capacity in the United States. Yes. We do need an immigration policy that feeds that innovation capacity in the United States, as well as our own indigenous uh, growth. Uh, but we also need to work with allies on that. But it's thank on you, it's and on thank you, you for to your determine uh, deemed export licenses, which some of these would need, right? And we, obviously, we would look at uh, who they are. Are you, are, are you are doing that them. now? Are you granting any now to uh -huh. Chinese? Uh, again, very complicated. Not what I really want to dig into right now. All right. Um, let me uh, turn to the uh, online audience. There's two questions from Catherine Kirby of American University that I'm going to combine, and then we'll go back to a uh, live audience. Uh, she says, you may be supportive of adopting innovative technologies for improving enforcement. Do you also see, do you see an overall appetite from leaders and officers, I think she means here in the United States, for the same thing, for adoption of new technology? And related, what do you think is the largest hurdle to the adoption of new technologies for improving enforcement. What was the second part of that bill? I didn't quite What is the, the largest hurdle to the adoption oh, of that, the technology? That part I got. What was the part on officers? Uh, are there other people in the administration who share the view that we, you need new technology? I think would be the best oh. way to put it. I would say, first of all, let me address the hurdle piece. Uh, the biggest hurdle? Money. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No they surprise there. Uh, whether other people in the administration share that I need new technology, that I really can't say because they're not operating BIS, I am. Uh, I think other people would say they want BIS to have robust capability you know, from the president on down. I mean, I'll, I'll uh, chime in there to right, say that we interviewed folks not just at BIS, but also from other federal agencies who have missions similar to BIS, and then also from other federal agencies who work with BIS. And essentially everybody that we talked to said, yes, BIS needs more modern technology. It would make it more easier for us who depend upon their mission. It would also make it more easy for us to work with them, um, literally like exchanging data at machine speed instead of email speed. Okay, let's uh, go back to the uh, in-person audience. Go ahead. Uh, how about 
Roberts and from The Economist. Thanks, Alan, Bill, and Greg for the conversation. Um, there's definitely smuggling going on. There was smuggling going on in Hong Kong of machine tools in 2019 in the wake of the Huawei actions. And smuggling kind of goes off the books, right? Your, your traditional response would be to put someone on the entity list, but by definition, if you're smuggling, you don't care about being on the entity list. So how do you hand these things over? It leaves your domain at a certain point, right? Like when, once you, you no longer care what list you're on. You're, you're doing whatever you have to do to get the supplies that are needed into the people who are paying you for them. So. How do you, can you talk about how you interact with colleagues at, I don't know, other enforcement agencies in the government to deal with that problem? It, it, it goes, you know, you're right. So obviously people are smuggling because I'm on the entity list and I can't get it the way I would want to. But let's be clear, smuggling has been going on since, you know, the first person developed fire, right? Someone must have smuggled the fire to the next person. Prometheus, from yeah, Zeus. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Right, right, from Prometheus on down who had smuggled it himself yes. From, yes. <laughs> from the gods. Uh, you know, at, at its highest end, when you find people doing that, you put them in handcuffs and you put them in prison. Uh, but you don't do that, right? Who, who does, well, who, I, my guys walk around with guns and handcuffs okay. and can absolutely put someone in handcuffs. And I have warrant authority and it's, you know, I have the ability to turn around ships and airplanes. Uh, and so, you know, we also shut down the uh, facade companies. Uh, we identify who the U.S. source is or the foreign source is. We work with foreign nations around that. And we have administration, administrative actions. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've done that uh, Matt Axelrod, uh, my assistant secretary of enforcement, has uh, started doing is raising the levels that we're playing at enforcement so that an administrative enforcement, oops, I did this, uh, let's settle and no one will know about it. We're not doing that. Now, there's some part of that that you know, we want people to self-confess. Uh, and you know, so there's different levels. But if we catch you doing something, we want other people to see your head on the pike. Not necessarily your head, but. Uh, <laughs> but so just a brief follow up on that then. You know, we, we know that there's been chips and tools being smuggled into China since at least 2019. Where are the since heads on? What, that, what's I'm the sure. best? What's the best head on a pike that we've had since then? You know, I'd what, have to what's, go, what's one what, head on like, a pike? Like there's all sorts of cases related to China, and there's certainly cases related to Iran, and there's certainly cases related to North Korea where people are sitting behind bars. There's there's a BIS list on the BIS website that's called. Don't be on this list. And it's like literally a list of all the, you know, the folks who got a cost. Yeah. Um, I just want to add one thing, uh, Hal, to, to your point, right, which is the, the reality of smuggling and the reality of export control evasion. Um, you know, evasion is when you lie on the license, but you got a license. So you say you're buying uh, XYZ, but in fact, you're, all, you're buying some prohibited capability. And then smuggling is when, you know, you're literally not even going you know, into a border checkpoint. You're just like sort of going across the border you know, in a mountain pass or something like that. Um, in, in one sense, forcing people into smuggling is a type of success because That's you right. would prefer to do evasion if you can get away with it. Um, and if you're doing smuggling, it's because you can't get away with evasion, right? It's the same way when, when drug smugglers were found a few years back to have their own submarine. On the one hand, it was terrifying because, oh my God, they can afford to buy their own submarine. But on the other hand, it meant that the border checks were working so well that they thought, oh my gosh, we're going to have to go ahead and buy a submarine in order to continue evading. So when you, when you succeed at enforcing the low-hanging fruit, the adversary obviously moves up the tree of sophistication, and that's why our skill set needs to be incredibly good at you know, moving up the tree of sophistication as well. And, and frankly, let me go a little further than that. You know, we were looking at, I won't call them loopholes, they're at, the way companies do business today, many people don't just buy a microchip coming off the line. Some people do, but you know, they're buying it from a distributor network if it's a commodity type item. You know, Apple is buying their chips designed for Apple. But if you're a refrigerator maker, you're buying it from a distributor. You didn't buy it direct from the fan. Right? So there's networks out there. So we have to look at the way those networks work and the way the business works and say, OK, how can I stop this distributor from moving it to the next person where I start losing control that may be then 
moving it into illicit uh, networks. And we are looking at that, where we can do that without completely breaking supply chains, because that's a different problem. Now, we're trying to do this so that we can still have a viable economy, but stopping where I need to stop. Because if it's a national security threat, I will stop it. All right, let me, we're getting near the end here. I've got several more, more than I can use, I think. But let me ask a couple quick ones here. China has passed a law to provide the authority to retaliate against companies that cooperate uh, with measures China considers against their interests. Have you seen any application of this law with respect to companies that are adhering to U.S. controls? We have not. Okay, that's from Michael Mullen of the Express Association. Uh, another sort of uh, yes or no question, I guess, is it's come from your predecessor, Eric Hirshhorn. Uh, is the new enforcement policy of requiring that settling respondents admit guilt affecting the number of voluntary self-disclosures? That's a good question. Um, Eric told me he wasn't spending time spending looking at what I was doing. So <laughs> I, I appreciate, Eric, you listening to this broadcast. Uh, so, we're, we're, you know, Bill, that's a, a good question. And I don't think we've, we've done that, but it's something that we're watching. The idea of AI data tools uh, for verification and enforcement is intriguing. U.S. companies believe in national security and would like to participate. Will there be an opportunity to collaborate, understand, and share best practices on any AI tools BIS might be using? This is from Qualcomm. Well, <laughs> uh, when, with, my, with the help of CSIS, Mr. Allen here, Congress decides to increase my budget and give me some money for some tools, we'll probably RFP it. Okay. In a competitive uh, space. Or I might go through a small uh, OTA type way of doing it. But we'll, we'll reach out to companies. For, the, for the ignorant, what's OTA type? OTA is an other transaction authority. Uh, uh, something DOD uses for outside the FAR uh, for innovative technology procurements. I see. Um, was there consideration on the new semiconductor rule uh, on the impact of including items not on the EAR? on universities and people doing fundamental research. This is from the University of Wisconsin. Obviously, the rule was aimed at exports to China, not on uh, research implication. Now, there are issues around research, frankly, that uh, we want universities to consider as they do their jobs. But this rule should not have impacted that. Well, if they're, if they're doing collaboration with Chinese universities, I would like them to take a look at what they're doing. I'm happy to have my export, con look, for a university, an export control officer will be happy to visit you, walk you through the processes. Uh, my EA folks, my export administration folks, also have reach out and training, and we'd be happy to work with you on how best to meet your need while still protecting national security. But I'm gonna do what I need to do to protect national security. Is BIS considering a deeper screening process into foreign ownership, control, or interest that would provide U.S. companies or research institutions with more knowledge about those with whom they're considering doing business? This is from GAO, so <laughs> you're going uh, to be investigated. I can't believe, I can't believe this is where GAO is asking their questions. <laughs> uh, am I going to provide U.S. companies insight into foreign, is this like a CFIUS question? I'm not sure I get. Uh, I mean, there's an entity list and the unverified list, and that's yeah, where you but those, give But your, those are, you know, other, those are obviously foreign con yeah. companies. I think presu the presumption of our paper is that the, the tools we're talking about will enable you to learn more and more quickly about ac actual ownership of companies and the provenance of the individual companies that may be hidden or obscured right now. I, I mean, I'll, and the question then is, are you going to share that kind of information with the private sector so they're more informed about who they should or should yeah. not be doing business they're, they're, with? From my background doing CFIUS when I was at DOD, most of that is highly classified. We never had problems identifying foreign ownership and who was doing what to whom, at least for CFIUS case, uh, including you know who was on the board, who was on the board behind the board, all that kind of stuff. 
but most of that is, yeah. Well, I, I'll add something there, which is um, I, I happen to believe that it's possible to do more without taking advantage of highly classified sources, that there's open source data sets that could be harvested and, and connected to a greater extent than is currently the case. But even if that is the case, you still have a sources and methods problem, right? BIS is very cautious about when they publish the justification for listing somebody on the entity list because the behaviors of other people who ought to be on the entity list very quickly changes. But, but again, I'm confused by the GAO question because if it's a if it's an export to someone on the entity list, or they're on the entity list, that's a publish the entity list. Uh, if it's, should I be worried about this company if I'm a, an American exporter? Obviously, we tell companies to do their due diligence. What's your, if you're asking for a license and you think this company that you're exporting to in China is really passing your product on to the military, don't. Don't do that. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because you're administratively guilty at that point. Yeah, I think the question, we, we need to stop, but I think the question is, relates to something that I ran into when, when, I was, uh, when I had this job. Occasionally companies would come in and say, we're thinking about doing X, uh, locating a factory or shipping this product. Uh, what do you think? I mean, we haven't done it. We may not do it. What do you think? Uh, my practice was to answer that question and not just say, go do dil due diligence. My practice was to say, well, this is what we think. Is that your practice? My practice is, if you're, it depends on what we're talking about, right? I can't tell them a company in Indonesia. If I'm saying, if you're doing business in China, do, first of all, you have your own risk calculus as a company, especially if you're doing operations in China, right? Uh, because just like what happened when Putin invaded illegally Ukraine, and suddenly all business stopped in Russia, and the United States did not have that great investment, but there's companies, the U.S. companies, who walked away from billions of dollars of assets in Russia. If Xi Jinping lines up force on the Taiwan Straits and starts moving across that Straits, or it looks like he's going to start moving across those Straits, companies are going to lose billions of dollars of assets in China. They need to be thinking about what they're doing in China. Not, not because I say it, it's just the threat nature of the world today. Uh, so they should be looking at that, and then they should be also looking at who they're doing business with. So I personally advise, probably not a good idea, but I can't tell a company what to do. That's what's the beauty of America, Whereas, well, right. which is different from what right. Xi Jinping can do to a Chinese company, I might add. Subject for another time, you're making an, uh, a decoupling argument. I, 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 I'm not. Um, and, and oh, go ahead and admit it. Of course you are. Our view is protect what we must, right? So don't export what we believe are the things that we need to protect national security to China. Promote where we can. So I'm allowing China with US technology to build a commercial airplane. If, if China decides they want to go to war with Taiwan, I'm sorry, GE is not going to be able to sell that engine to China. That's just the way it's going to work out. That is not a decoupling argument. That's an argument for China to change its behavior. And that's a good note to conclude on. Do you have a closing one minute, or do you want uh, to? Uh, no, just to say thank you all for, for coming and for listening to this incredibly important issue. And thank you to Undersecretary Estevez for spending the afternoon with us. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.